Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. Colin saw it all, watching each change as it took place. Every morning he was brought out, every, and every hour of each day when it didn't rain, he spent in the garden. Even grey days pleased him. He would lie on the grass, watching things growing, he said. If you watched long enough, he declared, you could see buds unsheath themselves. Also, you could make the acquaintance of strange, busy insect things running about on various unknown but evidently serious errands, sometimes carrying tiny scraps of straw, or feather, or food, or climbing blades of grass as if they were trees from whose tops one could look out to explore the country. A mole throwing up its mound at the end of its burrow and making its way out at last with the long nailed paws which looked so like elfish hands had absorbed him one whole morning. Ants' ways, beetles' ways, bees' ways, frogs' ways, birds' ways, plants' ways gave him a new word, world to explore. And when Dickon revealed them all and added foxes' ways, otters' ways, ferrets' ways, squirrels' ways, and trouts, and water rats' and badgers' ways, there was no end to the things to talk about and think over. And this was not the half of the magic. The fact that, they had, that he had really once stood on his feet had set Colin thinking tremendously, and when Mary told him of the spell she had worked, he was excited and approved of it greatly. He talked of it constantly. Of course there must be lots of magic in the world, he said wisely one day, but people don't know what it is like or how to make it. Perhaps the beginning is just to say nice things are going to happen until you make them happen. I am going to try an experiment. The next morning when they went to the secret garden, he sent at once for Ben Weatherstaff. Ben came as quickly as he could and found the Rajah standing on his feet under a tree, and looking very grand, but also very beautifully smiling. "'Good morning, Ben Weatherstaff,' he said. "'I want you and Dickon and Miss Mary to stand in a row and listen to me, because I am going to tell you something very important.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' answered Ben Weatherstaff, touching his forehead. One of the long concealed charms of Ben Weatherstaff was that in his boyhood he had once run away to sea and had made voyages, so he could reply like a sailor. I am going to try a scientific experiment, explained the Raja. When I grow up I am going to make great scientific discoveries, and I am going to begin now with this experiment. Aye, aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff promptly, though this was the first time he had heard a great, of great scientific discoveries. It was the first time Mary had heard of them either, but even at this stage she had begun to realise that, queer as he was, Colin had read about a great many singular things, and was somehow a very convincing sort of boy. When he held up his head and fixed his strange eyes on you, it seemed as if you believed him almost in spite of yourself, th though he was only ten years old, going on eleven. At this moment he was especially convincing because he suddenly felt the fascination of actually making a sort of speech, like a grown-up person. The great scientific discoveries I am going to make, he went on, will be about magic. Magic is a great thing, and scarcely anyone knows anything about it, except a few people in old books, and Mary a little, because she was born in India where there are fa uh, fakirs? I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, I do apologise. I believe Dickon knows some magic, but, pe but perhaps he doesn't kn know he knows it. He charms animals and people. I would never have let him come to see me if he had not been an animal charmer, which is a boy charmer too, because a boy is an animal. I am sure there is magic in everything, only we have not sense enough to get hold of it and make it do things for us like electricity and horses and steam. This sounded so imposing that Ben Weatherstaff became quite excited and really could not keep still. Aye, aye, sir, he said, and he began to stand up quite straight. When Mary found this garden, it looked quite dead, the orator proceeded. 
Then something began pushing things up out of the soil and making things out of nothing. One day things weren't there, and another they were. I had never watched things before, and it made me feel very curious. Scientific people are always curious, and I am going to be scientific. I keep saying to myself, what is it? What is it? It's something. It can't be nothing. I don't know its name, so I call it magic. I have never seen the sun rise, but Mary and Dickon have, and from what they tell me, I am sure that is magic too. Something pushes it up and draws it. Sometimes, since I've been in the garden, I've looked up through the trees at the sky, and I have had a strange feeling of being happy, as if something were pushing and drawing in my chest and making me breathe fast. Magic is always pushing and drawing and making things out of nothing. Everything is made out of magic. Leaves and trees, flowers and birds, badgers and foxes, and squirrels, and people. So it must be all around us, in this garden, in all the places. The magic in this garden has made me stand up and, and know I am going to live to be a man. I am going to make the scientific experiment of trying to get some and put it in myself and make it push and draw me and make me strong. I don't know how to do it, but I think that if you keep thinking about it and calling it, perhaps it will come. Perhaps that is the first baby way to get it. When I was going to try to stand that first time, Mary kept saying to herself as fast as she could, you can do it, you can do it, and I did. I had to try myself at the same time, of course, but her magic helped me, and so did Dickens. Every morning and evening, and as often in the daytime as I can remember, I am going to say, magic is in me, magic is making me well. I am going to be as strong as Dickon, as strong as Dickon. And you must all do it too. That is my experiment. Will you help, Ben Weatherstaff? Aye, aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff, aye, aye. If you keep doing it every day as regularly as soldiers go through drill, we shall see what will happen, and find out if the experiment succeeds. You learn things by saying them over and over and thinking about them until they stay in your mind forever, and I think it will be the same with magic. If you keep calling it to come to you and help you, it will get to be part of, of you, and it will stay and do things. I once heard an officer in India tell my mother that there were fakirs who said words over and over thousands of times, said Mary. I've heard Jem Fettleworth's wife say the same thing over thousands of times. Calling Jem a drunken brute, said Ben Weatherstaff dryly. Summer Alice come of that, sure enough. He gave her a good hiding and went to Blue Lion and got as drunk as a lord. Colin drew his brows together and thought a few minutes. Then he cheered up. Well, he said, you see something did come of it. She used the wrong magic until she made him beat her. If she'd used the right magic and had said something nice, perhaps he wouldn't have got as drunk as a lord, and perhaps, perhaps he might have bought her a new bonnet. Ben Weatherstaff chuckled, and there was a shrewd ad admiration in his little old eyes. Thou art a clever lad as well as a straight-legged one, Mr. Colin, he said. Next time I see Bess Fettleworth, I'll give her a bit of a hint of what magic will do for her. She'd be rare and pleased if the scientific experiment worked. And so, so had Jem. Dickon had stood listening to the lecture, his round eyes shining with curious delight. Nut and shell were on his shoulders, and he held a long-eared white rabbit in his arm, and stroked and stroked it softly while it laid its ears along its back and enjoyed itself. Do you think the experiment will work? Colin asked him, wondering what he was thinking. He so often wondered what Dickon was thinking when he saw him, looking at him or at one of his creatures, with his happy wide smile. He smiled now, and his smile was wider than usual. Aye, he answered, that I do. It'll work same as seeds do when sun shines on them. It'll work for sure. Shall us begin it now? 
And with that, we come to the end of the episode. So I will say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.